Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, it's a beautiful morning. It's raining. Praise the Lord. Getting some rain out here. But I was doing a study, uh, Proverbs 26, 4. If you want to turn to Proverbs 26, 4. Answering a fool according to his folly. We're going to do this one. It's going to be part one. And I wanted to talk about mock mocking before we get into the actual answering a fool according to his folly. There's a great example of that in the Bible. But all of a sudden I started talking to the Lord and I was thinking, well, a lot of people think that that justifies mocking. You're answering a fool according to his folly. That's mocking. And it's not mocking. Okay? Mocking has no play in this on the second half of this verse. But the first half, it does. So let's go to Proverbs 26.4. Verse 4 it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Then the second one says, verse 5, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Answer not a fool, the first person part. Then it says, Answer a fool. It's not a contradiction. What's going on here? The first part is saying, Be careful how you answer a fool. Okay? Because when you answer a fool according to his folly, you can fall into the trap of being like the fool. The world looks at you like you're no different from that person over there. You're no different than me. You know how many times we say that with lost, the lost, these professing Christians? The lost world looks at them and goes, you look like me, you act like me, you talk like me. You're no different from me. See how that works? Um, so I wanted to go through this and talk with you because there are some situations where men are mocking and it's justified in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, I, if you want to in the comment section, please remember words have meaning. We're going to go over examples of what mocking is. Some people take it out of context and add its own definition. Well, they're name calling. That's not mocking. Name calling isn't mocking. Okay? There's more to mocking. Okay? So, in the Bible, most of the people doing the mocking are fools. You go throughout the Old Old Testament to the New Testament, most of the people mocking are fools. Right? And who are they mocking most of the, most of the time? God. Okay? When the people in the Old Testament are mocking the Jewish people, they're mocking God. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. There's a situation where Sarah and Hagar where Sarah overhears Hagar mocking her. And what it does it do? It causes contention between the two. Friction. It causes Abraham a lot of trouble. Okay? It's negative. It's not a positive thing. Okay? When you um, mock. So let's go to 2 Chronicles 36.16. 2 Chronicles 36.16. I like Chronicles. I went through Chronicles recently. Uh, you want to learn why David was, uh, was a man after God's own heart? You don't read it in Kings as much. You read a little bit of it there, but you read a lot of it in 1 Chronicles. It goes through and explains David's heart towards God. Everything he ever collected, gold, silver, brass, all this stuff, he put it to the Lord, and he wanted to build a house to the Lord. You read a lot of all his heart's desire to do things for the Lord, in First Chronicles, um, first to Second Chronicles, but we are in Second Chronicles thirty six sixteen, way back there. Let's we'll start at fifteen. Okay, this is what's going on a lot of times in the Old Testament, and the Lord God of their father sent to them by his messengers, rising up bedtimes. Uh, B times, I'm sorry, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. I'll stop there. What's going on? Throughout the whole Old Testament, you have the Jewish people falling away and you have the Jewish people coming back to God. Then the next king comes along and they fall away. And then the next king comes along and he, he sets everything right and points people back to serving God and obeying God. But here's how he does it a lot of times. <coughs> Pardon me. He does it through, it says messengers, but we're going to find out later. Messengers can be another word for prophet. They can be prophets. Those messengers are prophets. Okay? They're there to prophesy to them and tell them, hey, you're in sin. 
you're not following the word of the Lord, and this is what's going to happen to you. Okay? God, it shows here that he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He had compassion for the uh, Jewish people. That's why he sent the prophets and the messengers. He didn't do it because he hated them and just wanted to destroy them and wanted to see them just utterly suffer. He sent it to them to get them to repent, have sorrow in their heart for sinning against God and not obeying God's laws, and turn back to Jesus Christ. Okay. But what's the reaction a lot of times we read throughout the Old Testament? Verse 16, But they mocked the messengers of God. No, stop there. Notice it says they mock the messengers of God. They, in their heads, oh, I'm mocking this man right here. But as we keep reading, who are they really mocking? Let's keep reading. And despised his words. Who's the his there? Oh, it's the messengers. Let's keep going. And misused his prophets. Oh, that just excluded the messenger. Until the wrath of the Lord arose again against his people till there was no remedy. Okay? It was the Lord they were mocking. Oh no, I'm mocking this man. You're mocking the Lord. When you have Bible-believing, God-fearing men standing up and preaching the Word of God, and you've got people coming on their channel, and they start mocking them, okay? They can't refute what we're teaching, so what do they resort to? They resort to mocking them. Let that sink in real quick. That's another reason why I do not promote mocking wolves in sheep's clothing in the lost world. Okay? We have absolute truth. We have a foundation. We are in a standing position. They are not. They have no foundation. The King James Bible, God's perfect written word for English speaking people. Book above all books. Okay. This is God's perfect written word. We have something to stand on. We don't have to resort to mocking. Okay? They have to resort to mocking because they can't refute Scripture. Okay. That's the way it is. That's why I'm, I'm really against mocking. And we're going to go through here and look at a, an example of somebody who mocked that the, it was the Lord mocking through him. He's in a special office. When we get to the New Testament, the Christians aren't mocking people. Right? And if I'm wrong, I mean, show me. We're going to get into it, okay? Name-calling is not the same thing as mocking. I'm, going to get, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the point is, is when we do this, and because some people might shut the video off now and start saying, well, what about this, what about this, what about that? Remember, definitions, words have meaning, okay? Mocking and name-calling are two different things. Okay? And we're going to see an example of what mocking is. But as we see here, till there was no remedy. Okay? Some people will get to the point where they will mock absolute truth, they will hate absolute truth, they've rejected absolute truth all their life. God will harden their heart. And at that point, He'll say, I'm hardening your heart. You want the world? You can have the world. I'm done with you. I'm done trying to come to you and trying to send messengers, you know, people preaching the plan of salvation. I'm done sending messengers, prophets, warning you about the time of Jacob's trouble, warning you about hell. Those are prophets. When you're in the ministry of reconciliation, we're in the last days, we're getting close to the time of Jacob's trouble, and we're preaching the plan of salvation, and we're warning people about hell, we're prophets. It's a future event that will happen if you continue to reject Jesus Christ. Continue to reject repentance and understanding true belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the, on the cross is understanding, not knowing, but understanding the gospel. You can't understand the gospel if you skip repentance, but you have all these people that mock me because I pe preach repentance. It's godly sorrow. Sorrow towards God. I think I mentioned this before, but I, I just I just get frustrated sometimes, and I'm like, really, did he just say that? Some guy said, you can't have godly sorrow. That's only something that God has. It's only something God can have. So God has sorrow towards himself. Really. No, godly sorrow is sorrow towards God. For what? Your personal sins. 
That's true biblical repentance. And you've got people that mock me, and that mock you, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you try to preach the plan of salvation. You cannot skip a step. It's an old video I did, um, uh, the plan of salvation, I can't remember the name of the video, but it had to do with the, like a map. I did this really crude thing on the computer, and uh, um, I moved the office around, so everything's moved around, so my monitors are now over here. But I did this thing where I showed it's like a road map to treasure, and that treasure is God's grace. Okay, it's a road map. You don't earn God's grace. This isn't earning it. This is telling you how to find it. And you've got to follow the steps. If you skip so much, if you're doing a regular treasure hunt, if you skip so much as one step, you will never, ever, ever find that treasure. So I said, I hid this here. Here's the, here's the steps. Here's instructions on how to find what I hid. The Bible says if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Why? Because the lost people don't want to follow the plan of salvation. They don't want to follow the instructions on how to find God's grace. True sal biblical salvation is God saving man by His grace. They don't want to go through the plan of salvation. They don't want to follow the steps. So if the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Absolutely. That all comes into focus. But back to the study. You get people that will mock you. I'm coming to preach the truth to you, and they will mock you. Why? Because they don't have the leg to stand on. And as we get it further on down, we're going to find out the number one reason why people mock, speak foolishly, when we get to part two, is sin. They love their sin. Lust. They love the world. That's more important than Jesus Christ. That's why they mock you. They love their sin, they love their flesh, they love their false religion that they're a part of. This easy believism, it's false religion. Okay? You just say a little, uh, some people say you just say a little prayer and you're in. No, you don't. Okay? God's still the one that does the saving. Repentance, I told you what repentance is. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That the blood that was shed on the cross was Jesus' blood. He was beaten. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was beaten within an inch of his life. Okay, he was whipped within an inch of his life. Blood gushing down. He had his beard ripped out. He had to carry a cross on his back all the way up to where they nailed him to it. And he died. And he rose again the third day. Death burial, and resurrection. Okay, It's God's blood that was shed on, on the cross, and Jesus was innocent, He was perfect, and He died to pay for the sins of the world. And when you come to Him truly broken, you can say, He died for my personal sins. Not just for my sins, because we're all sinners. My personal sins. You confess both in prayer. And you ask, it shows that you're not ashamed, and you ask God to save you. We've got plenty of studies, scripture after scripture after scripture, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. What's salvation? God's grace. What leads to God's grace? Repentance does. And what makes repentance work? Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. If you don't have sorrow in your heart for your personal sins, that repentance doesn't work. It's not just a change of mind. It's not just going from unbelief to belief. Those are lies by Satan to try to keep you from coming to God broken, having sorrow for your personal sins. It's personal. It starts at salvation. Your personal walk with Jesus Christ starts at salvation. It's personal. And I'm kind of getting off on a tangent a little bit because I have so many people who mock me when I preach, preach the true plan of salvation. The Trinity versus the Godhead. You have people like this that will mock you. The plan of salvation, there's a changed life after salvation. God owns you. You love God. You want to please God with every aspect of your life. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters Christ, I'm still seeing it with a lot of you. You're still holding on to stuff. Not everybody, 
but you're still holding on to something saying this is mine and it's like no every aspect of your life has to be about Jesus Christ is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid I love that all, uh, hymn since uh, I got it from Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries it's an amazing hymn is your all you can't be holding on to anything saying this is for me and I'm going to try to find a way to justify it and then finding a way to justify it you got to mess up scripture and then when a messenger comes along to say hey what you're doing is wrong according to scripture are you going to be like the lost world and mock them? Make sure you're not holding on to anything wicked and anything sinful. When I first got saved it took several years before God really brought me to my knees to get me to let go of everything and even now there's some things that I realize that I'm trying to grab it back sometimes and the Lord's like nope don't touch it don't have anything to do with it I still find things in the house every once in a while which I think is I'm still shocked and amazed and praise God for how he works because there's stuff that I've walked by a million times and one time I walk by the Holy Spirit just convicts me and says hey there's something wrong with that item and you start doing research in it, and I had to throw items out. I had items from um, China and Japan that had all these the dogs on it that were actually demons that protect the home. A demon actually protects your home? Uh, no, it destroys a home. Okay, inviting demons in and telling demons, hey, protect my home. But I saw that, and it finally got to me, and I threw them out. They're still, God is still cleaning up my life to this day, but there's a changed life. Your whole life is about pleasing God. And you have people that mock us for it. Why? They don't have a leg to stand on. We do. They don't have a foundation. They don't have Jesus Christ, the foundation. They have His Word. A lot of these false converts have His Word. And they'll read His Word. But they have no understanding. They lack understanding. They have head knowledge. But they lack understanding. They'll never understand this book. God won't show them anything. They'll parrot what other people have said. They'll make a mess of the Bible when they try to do their own understanding. I do that for like their own understanding, not God's understanding, true understanding, but their own. And they'll make a mess of the Bible. Right? They mock us when we teach to change life. When we come around and say, hey, wait a second, God's just showed us that, you know what, we need to stop using Trinity. It's not in the Bible. Trinity is not a title for God. Godhead is. And when we tell people that, what happens? They attack you, and some of them will even mock you. Why do they mock us when we say Trinity isn't in the Bible? Godhead's not in the Bible. I mean, Godhead's in the Bible. God in three persons is what I meant to say. Sorry, Lord. And sorry, brethren. Um, Godhead is in the Bible. It is a title for God. But God in three persons is not in the Bible. And we show them in Scripture all four times that, that any part of the Godhead is referenced as a person, it's Jesus Christ. We have scripture, we have foundation, there's only one person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. The Trinity teaches there's three persons. It's a totally separate thing than the Bible. And we come to them and try to preach absolute truth to them, what do they do? They mock us. Why? They, don't, they love their sin, their Trinity, their pagan gods, plural, their Antichrist, that they like to call Jesus, Satan, he's okay with their sin. He's okay with not having a changed life. He's okay with them holding stuff back for themselves, not giving everything to Jesus Christ. That he's okay with it. Right, I keep going through the list. All these things, when we are preaching, we're messengers for Jesus Christ, and we stand for what's truth, and we preach the absolute truth. God is our foundation. His Word is our foundation. Jesus is our foundation. We're standing, they're not, they can't handle it. So what do they do? They mock us. That's the sign of someone who mocks. They have no room to stand on. Today, okay, we're going to talk about in the past, in the Old Testament, but today it's a sign of somebody who has no leg to stand on. That's why I always warn you, brothers and sisters of Christ, be careful with your mocking. I know it's just one verse, but I'm getting a lot ahead of myself. Uh, we're going to talk about, in the Old Testament, we're going to look at an example of somebody who did mock. But did he mock just to mock? And who was he speaking for? Remember, in the Old Testament, you had these messengers would verbally preach the Word of God. It was as if God was speaking. They would pass on the message that God gave them, and it was verbal. 
It was the spoken word. Is that today? No. If I say, thus saith the Lord, you guys should better be getting this out and saying, okay, where is it at? Where is it at? Back then, when you had a man of God speak the word of God, you listened. Today, we're supposed to go chapter and verse. Someone says, thus saith the Lord, or say, this is how a Christian is supposed to be. Anything that has to do with your walk with the Lord and how the Christian is supposed to be, chapter and verse. What we're supposed to believe, what's going to go on in the future, what's the future of this world and everything, chapter and verse. That's how we are today. In the Old Testament, it was, find me a prophet. We need, we need to talk to God. Find me a prophet. Uh, turn to 1 Kings 18.21. Go back a little bit. 1 Kings 18.21. Best example that I found in the Old Testament. Best example in the Old Testament of someone mocking, and there's a purpose behind it, but that person in the Old Testament, we're going to talk about Elijah, he's speaking for the Lord. Okay? Verse 21. Let's get through here. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? You had the priest of Baal, and you had, he was the last priest for, for God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How, are you going to be, how, how long are you going to be torn between two opinions, two worlds, if you want to say? Same thing we ask these false converts. How long are you going to be torn between the two? They're trying to hold on to the world and trying to be a Christian, and you can't do both. And yet, no matter how much we preach to them, they mock us. You can't have both. He's saying you cannot serve these false gods and serve God. How are you going to be torn of two opinions? If the Lord be God, capital G God, follow Him. Until we tell these, uh, I keep bringing it back to today to apply to encourage the brethren. Make sure you're following God in every aspect of your life. Hold nothing back. And to these false converts, if any of them come across this channel, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and hold on to the world and serve the world and serve Satan. You can't serve two. Here we go. But if Baal, that's another word for Satan, all of Satan has a lot of different names, it's Satan. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not, and the people answered him not a word. You can follow Satan or you can follow God. You can't do both. Only one's the true God. And we always preach this at this ministry, and I've had other brethren preach it too, that there are so many false Jesuses out there. But only one true God, only one Jesus that's real among all these false Jesus, and all these false Jesus can be summed up as what? It's Satan counterfeiting Jesus, trying to get people to worship him. Verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain of the prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. It's a lot of men. 23, let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of, the, of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Capital G God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Remember, the Jews require a sign. It's the Old Testament. 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first. For ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. He wanted them to go first for a reason. And we're going to find this out as we keep reading. Verse 26. And they took the bullocks which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning, evening, until noon. Uh, morning, even until noon. So from morning to noon. Saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. 
nor any that answered. You know, a lot of these people, brothers and sisters in Christ, you hear people say, well, I tried praying for salvation and everything and tried prayer, but God just didn't answer my prayers. It's because they weren't praying to Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of Scripture, who is God fully and completely, not a third of God, not the second God member of the Godhead, uh, the, the, the Trinity, I mean, and he's not the second member of the God either. He is the Godhead manifest fully and completely. Okay? In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. They're not praying to the real God. When, you real, when people realize that as a false convert, my prayers weren't getting answered, something just starts to set right with me. My life wasn't right, something wasn't right, and God showed me the truth and pointed me in the right direction. I got saved, and all of a sudden, God started answering my prayers. He started hearing my prayers because I was truly saved and born again. And you've got all these people that attack. Well, I've tried prayers. I tried praying for the Lord to save me so many times, and it just never... They weren't praying to the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Or they were holding iniquity in their heart. Remember King David? I think it was in Psalms. If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. Yeah, it'd be nice to go to heaven, but I'm going to hold on to this world. And I'm not letting go. God won't hear you. Holding iniquity in your heart, God won't hear you. You pray to a false God, and you're wondering why the capital G God isn't hearing, he won't answer. He's not, you're not praying to the right one. Okay. Keep going. And they leaped upon the altar which was made, and it came to pass at noon... Notice what's going on. The people are watching this. Elijah's sitting there watching it. What does Elijah do at, at noon? Then Elijah, that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God. Notice there's a lowercase g God. He's not calling him capital G God. Either he, ta either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after this manner. So first he mocks, let me stop for a second, first he's mocking them. But there's a reason for his mocking. There's always a purpose with God. He doesn't do things just to do things. He doesn't do something that the lost world does, does mostly as a whole towards him just to do it. There's a reason. Okay. Verse 28. He got them to do, I'm getting ahead of myself, he got them to do everything they could. Leaving nothing out, doing everything, every, you know, heard that saying, every trick in the book? They tried everything, they're doing everything they can, and the people are watching them. He's getting them to just go crazy, doing everything they can, and nothing's happening. Verse 28, and they cried aloud and cut themselves. See, they were just crying aloud, jumping on the altar and everything, all th till noon. Now, because Elijah mocked them, they're going all out. They're cutting themselves after their manner with knives and lassets, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. The people are looking at them thinking, they're nothing. Nothing's going on. Nothing's happening. Look how crazy they're getting. That was the whole point of the mocking. And Elijah spoke for the Lord. It was the Lord mocking them. But there was a purpose to it. To get everybody to see how worthless their God was. The purpose of that mocking was to lead people back to the Lord. You didn't mock just to mock. He wasn't mocking just to mock. There was a purpose to it. Let's keep reading. Mm -hmm. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. Remember, they've lost all the attention over there with the priest of Baal. They're doing this all day, morning, noon, to evening. And they're cutting themselves. They're going crazy. And nothing is happening. They've lost their attention. They, the people are like, they're nothing. And Elijah says, Come here. And they all come. Come near to him. And he prepared, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. I can just imagine it. Not imagine it. I can 
I'll imagine something that really happened. Because feign imagination. Uh, I can picture it in my head. I'll say it that way because I want to say it right. I'll pi I can picture it in my head as he's going about doing this, he's explaining to the Jewish people, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing that. He's explaining to the people, getting them to remember why they serve the Lord God, why they do things. Here's these 12 stones. What do they represent? The 12 tribes. Okay. And then uh, the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Thou name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Verse 32, And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar a great, as great as would contain two measures of seeds. Seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill your barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did, and, and they did it the third time. And we'll stop there for a second. It says, And laid him on the wood. It's talking about the, the, um, the bullock. But when I'm reading this, just as a side note, it says him, okay, who was sacrificed for all the world, for the sins of the world, not for everybody, for those who would come to him, but for the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. You look down there, they dumped water on it, on the, the whole sacrifice. Was Jesus not uh, baptized? And it says, do it a third time. How many days was he in the grave before he rose again? Three days. Is there anything to it? Am I just stretching? I could be. But I just thought that was very interesting. But he's getting the people to watch. The people are paying attention to him. And notice this isn't an all-day thing with Elijah. It's not an all-day thing like with the priests of Baal. Verse 35. And the water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. I believe totally, even though Elijah was mocking him, it was God mocking him. Yeah. At thy word. 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And they said, The Lord, He is the God. Okay? The Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the God. That's so one of the old studies we did. Lord, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. There's but one capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus was in the Old Testament. The Lord, He is God. 40. Elijah said unto him, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Okay. The whole point of this is mocking. We're talking about mocking today. It was God through Elijah that was mocking those priests of Baal. And why did he do it? He did it for the purpose of his people, to lead his people back to him. There was a reason behind it. Okay. Are we to mock today? People will grab this verse and say, See, we can mock. Are we in the same office as Elijah? Some people say, Well, yeah, you know, we're, we're the same. Uh, turn real quick to 2 Kings 2.22. That's Elijah. Okay. What we're going to talk about now is Elisha. We're going to talk about Elisha. Remember, Elisha asked, I'm just going to go real quick. Elisha asked that a portion of Elijah's spirit would be upon him. And that whole thing about the mantle, and if he saw Elisha being carried up, he'd get a portion of his spirit. And he went around and he became the next prophet 
to preach the word of the Lord to the people. So we're, we're the same thing. The Old Testament prophets were the same, right? Turn to 2 Kings 2.22. Didn't have to go far in 2 Kings. We have to see 2 Kings 2.22. I went too far. Okay. 2 Kings 2.22. We're going to be talking about Elijah. Sometimes I get a mistake. The Elisha and the Eli Elijah and the Elisha. We're talking about Elisha right now. Verse 22. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the sayings of Elisha which he spoke. Okay. And he went up thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city. We'll stop there for a second. I had a brother in Christ that showed me. It was a good study. I wish he'd do a video. But children in the Bible have been referred, I mean age, I mean there's a difference between us being called children of God no matter how old we are, but when it talks about an age, a specific age, children, when you're talking about young children, it's been referred to people up to the age of 19. So I had to stand corrected on that when I come to that age of accountability and that's a whole other study. Uh, it's been used for people up to the age of 19. So this says little children. So they're way younger than 19. These are little children. And look at what they're doing. And mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. You had this old man trying to climb up a hill because he's trying to cut, because he went up from thence unto Bethel. Up. He's trying to go up a hill and they see this old man trying to climb a hill and he's probably going really slow and taking his time because if you one wrong footing, you can twist your ankle, you can fall and break your leg, break your arm. And they're mocking him. But we're in the same office, right? Where it's the same thing as the Old Testament as we are today, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 24. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the woods and tear forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. He cursed them. And bears came out and killed those kids. And how many of them? Forty and two children. Today are we to curse our enemies? We let God do it. He spoke for the Lord. When they were mocking Him, they were mocking God. We're not in the same off, I mean, we are as far as when they mock us, they're mocking God, but back then, it was a serious thing. It's a serious thing today, but I have to keep correcting myself. The point I'm trying to get across is, we don't curse them. We give them to the Lord. The Lord will deal with them. We don't curse them so that something bad comes out and kills them. We give it to the Lord and say, Lord, I give them to you. I've tried preaching truth to them. They don't want it. They've mocked me. I give them to you. Are we in the same situation back then today? No. God's given us His perfect written word. Our life, our words, our actions, and even our appearance is to line up with this book. In the Old Testament, people had to go through men of God, prophets, that were set in a priesthood. Got a bitch. So, um, Proverbs 1, turn to Proverbs 1. There's a lot of other places you go to, but I wanted to use those to show that A, yes, there was people in the Old Testament that were mocking, but it was the Lord mocking them through them. Who's the one, number one person that does the mocking that's justified? Proverbs 1.20 
26. Okay, just make sure I'm in the right place. 20. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of, of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in the scorning, and fools hate knowledge? What's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Okay. What do, we try to try to, what do I try to push in this ministry? Words have meaning and to encourage the brethren. And one of the things is, is you need to fear the Lord. You need to, I want to hold on to this sin and I want this area to be just my thing that I do. The Lord has nothing to do with it. Where's the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord needs to be there in your life. Anytime temptation comes in, anytime someone tries to get you to go left or tries to get you to go right and not stay the course, where's the fear of the Lord? Okay. That's the beginning of wisdom. And it's talking about wisdom. Fools hate knowledge. Verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. When we get saved in the New Testament, it talks about the Holy Spirit. It comes in and does that very same thing. Okay. Verse 24. Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel. What did we just see? What did we read up there in Second Chronicles? The Lord sent messengers. Set not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. Correction. Okay. 25. Reproof is verbal. Uh, correction becomes physical. Okay. Um, but reproof is before all. You're correcting before all. Or correction can be one-on-one. -on -one. Verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. They've rejected, rejected, rejected. God will laugh at their calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. This is the Lord. Okay, He can mock and be just. Why? Because if you go through here, He's not mocking just to mock. What did they do? But ye, have set, but ye have set not all my counsel. They've ignored the Lord. His word, His counsel, don't do this. You go through the Old Testament, a lot of times when they failed the Lord, they didn't seek His counsel. The men that deceived uh, Joshua at the, the um, tower, uh, no, uh, the walls of Jericho. After the walls of Jericho, these men came by that were neighbors, and they were supposed to utterly destroy everybody. They deceived them. How'd they do it? They didn't seek the counsel of God. When someone took something from Jericho, they asked counsel, how are we going to take this city? Because it looked too fortified. I don't know, think we can take this city. We need God's help. They took the city, and oh, we're so great. They went out to battle the next battle. Did they ask God's counsel? If they did, maybe that, nobody would have died because God would have said there's sin in the camp. But they didn't seek God's counsel. They just went out to war. Okay, we're strong. We're good. We can do this on our own. And come to find out, somebody had took some uh, silver, silver, gold, and raiment, I think it was, and buried it in their tent when they weren't supposed to take anything from Jericho. Okay? When they sought the counsel of the Lord, most of the time, they obeyed it. There was times where they sought counsel from two different sources and chose the wrong source. They denied the counsel of the Lord. Okay. But that's why God's mocking them. You've denied my counsel. You decided to go your own route. Your life is falling apart. Whose fault is that? It's not my fault. It's the Lord saying, it's not my fault. I tried to warn you. I tried to counsel you. I tried to point you in the right direction. Therefore, he mocks when your fear cometh. You didn't want anything from me. You wanted to listen to them. You didn't want my counsel. You wanted the counsel of the world. Listen to the counsel of the world. Go to your own gods. He's done that before in the Old Testament. Seek those gods. Seek them for help. He's mocking them. Seek them for help. You didn't want my help. Let, they, they, let them help you. And sometimes the people are like, No, we want you. We were wrong to trust these false gods. And they truly repented, and God helped them. But that mocking was there was a purpose to it. Okay. 
Verse 27, when, you, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Okay, when your fear cometh. Verse 28, then shall they call upon me. So he mocked, but then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. I think that's where I'm supposed to stop. we got to keep going. See, for, for the turning away of the simple, I have this marked in my Bible as a good example of someone who's false convert. Okay, God mocks false converts. Absolutely. Are we supposed to? For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the pr prosperity of the fools shall be destroyed, shall destroy them. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. You have all these people, I'm not, I'm prospering. These false converts, these Christ rejecting people out there just flat out reject people. Well, I'm prosper, fools shall be destroyed. 33, but whosoever hearkeneth unto me, hearken unto me, see it turns it back to God. To God. Hearkened unto me, shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. It's, this is put for us to let us know we need to fear God. We need to heed His counsel. We need to obey His word. We need to live it. Okay, It's for us, the whole purpose of it. He's going to be mocking them. So if anybody that sees it, those people that fall under what we just read, he's going to be mocking those people, and those of us that see it, even some that can be part of the mock around it, that when they hear the counsel of the Lord, they'll obey it. They'll get saved. Okay? They'll turn to God. There's a purpose to it. Elijah, when he did it, it was to turn the people back to God and show how unfruitful and how worthless those false gods were. There was a purpose to the mocking. But God does the mocking, okay? Let's get to the New Testament. Because we're going through the Old Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, you don't have to turn here, but Matthew 2.6, I want to mention this because it's the first time that mocking is mentioned in the New Testament. And it talks about Herod, well, it's a collection of books called the New Testament. But it's not the New Testament. Well, we're going to, I'm sorry, we're not going to talk about the New Testament yet. We're going to talk about the earthly ministry, Jesus' earthly ministry. Okay? But Matthew 2.16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and set forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, for two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. The wise men weren't the ones that mocked God. Okay? Read the whole story out. Okay? Herod was lying to them, saying, Oh, when you find this child, send word to me. Come tell me about it so I may go and worship him. No, Herod was going to kill him. That was on Herod's heart the whole time. But what happened? When the wise men were supposed to come back, the same way that they came, God, in a dream, warned them to go a different way. And they went the different way. He's blaming them, the wise men, for mocking him, but it was God that was mocking him. Be not deceived. That's another verse we'll go through. God is not mocked. It was God that was mocking him, not the wise men. Mm -hmm. So turn to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Jesus' earthly ministry. I went through looking to see where Jesus was mocking anybody. Okay, The word mock is used and it's not okay so brethren if you want to put down in the comment section why well, I believe this is Jesus mocking put the verse down and I'll talk with you about it but remember there's a difference between mocking mocking what we saw with um, I want to say the right one Elijah he took what they do and used it against them okay he was mocking them for what they say what we see here the number one people mocking, in the, the only people mocking in the ministry, God's earthly ministry, when Jesus walked on the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh, we call it his earthly ministry, is lost people. And they're taking God's words and throwing it in his face, basically. 
This is the counsel. I, the, he's given me his counsel, and I'm taking that counsel, and I'm throwing it back in his face. That's what's going on. Okay. But if you can show me, he, he, we'll talk about some of the name calling. We'll talk about some of that stuff. But that's not mocking. Okay. Using a name that he didn't, he didn't uh, make fun of their actual name. But he used words to describe who they were. So the people could understand it. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. But Matthew chapter 20. Verse 17. Okay, yeah. Just make sure this is this is Jesus talking. So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. I'm sorry, yeah, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Verse 17, And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him and the third day he shall rise again this is him explaining to them that hey this is what I'm going to be going through we always talk about um, the physical pain that he went through but how often do we talk about the spiritual you have a man that loves his people he's there for his people and all he's ever done is for his people, the Jewish people, the healing, the raising from the dead, the feeding. He had compassion upon his people. Here's his cancel. He's here, and it's been just thrown away. Just thrown away. Okay? And they're mocking him. They're using his words, as we're going to keep reading, they use his words against him and mock him with his own words. Verse 20, then came he, I mean, it's like you saying you have such love for somebody and you want to help them and they don't want any help and they throw everything back in your face. How do you feel? You have to get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm moving on. But how do you feel when they're throwing it in your face? You're there to help them. They're heading for destruction and you're there to help them and they just throw it in your face. Verse 20, then came, no, we stop at 19, and he shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock. So here we see Jesus is prophesying, this is what's going to happen. They're going to mock me. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles, and I'm going to be mocked to the Gentiles. Turn to Matthew 27. Let's go over to Matthew 27. 27, 27. Then the soldiers of the governors took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! He asked Peter, Who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's their king. He's there to be their king. That's what the Christ is. All right? They're mocking that and throwing it in his face. Verse 30. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Sometimes I leave that out too. They spit upon him. Verse 31. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. That prophecy come true? Yes. Who's doing the mocking? Lost people. Here it's Gentiles. They're mocking Jesus Christ, who he is. 
And when we read through this, it still gets me when people say, well, no, you don't have to come to God broken and having sorrow for your personal sins against Him. Look what He's going through because of your personal sins. You don't have to have any sorrow whatsoever for your personal sins. Okay. They des these people, these false converts, they deserve to be mocked of God. Absolutely. I am not trying to downplay it. They deserve and they are mocked of God. But are we supposed to go out of our way to just get into mocking left and right and try to fall for that um, and fail that first verse, Proverbs 26.4, where it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly. Their folly is they're mocking God and they're heading for destruction. We're not supposed to be like them. Mm -hmm. Verse 32. Um, no, we're done there. 31. 30, 31. They took away to crucify him. Okay. Turn to Matthew 20. Okay, we don't have to turn that far. Just go down to 37. Same verse, Matthew 27, verse 37. Here they get him out there, and he's nailed to the cross. And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself. For if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Now stop. You say, well, it doesn't say mocking. They're mocking him. Wait, hold on. First, they're taking what he said and throwing it back in his face. We preach the gospel. Here's the love of God, and it gets thrown back in our face. It gets thrown back in God's face. Okay? The temple he's talking about is his body. He was going to die and be raised again the third day. Okay. But they're mocking him. Well, no, it doesn't say mocking. Let's keep reading. Verse 41. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him. Likewise. So right there, just let us know. They were mocking him. And now the priests are mocking him. With the scribes and elders and said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. He healed a lot of people. He raised people from the dead. He fed people that were hungry. Mm -hmm. he, had, he saved others. He himself can't. He cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. No, they wouldn't have. No, they wouldn't have. Sorry, I just got to throw that in there. They would not believe him at all. We're going to go to 44. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will save him. For he said, I am the Son of God. They're mocking him, who he is. 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. The thieves, plural, cast in his teeth. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. I think I was supposed to stop at 44. I just want to keep reading. But remember that part. Both thieves were also mocking him. Okay? It said, cast the same in his teeth. Everybody's mocking him. Is Jesus mocking them? No. Jesus hasn't mocked anybody. Not yet. His earth, with earthly ministry, where he's walking on this earth, show me scripture where he mocked somebody. Okay? Uh, there's times where he used parables to put people in their place. And remember the Pharisees? They, they foresee he was speaking of them through that parable. He's used names. We're going to get to some of those uh, right here. We don't have to turn there. But Matthew 12, 38, that's where I get uh, O generation. Oh, no, sorry. Why well, I say 238? I messed up there. But Matthew 12, 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. He calls them vipers. Okay? And Matthew 23. Uh, 
uh, 33, it says, Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And you can read the whole context of why he's doing it. He calls them serpents again. Uh, the serpents, and that calls them vipers. He calls the, the J uh, Jewish people, or not Jewish people, um, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and scribes, he tells them that they look like whited sepulchers. On the outside, they look like whited sepulchers, but on the inside, they're full of dead man's bones. Okay, these are ways to illustrate who they are and how they are acting. But is this mocking? No. Right? He calls them out for who they are and put the spot. And if I miss the spot where he is mocking, remember, Jesus is God. But the whole point is, show me where he's actually mocking somebody. He takes their own words and throws it in their face and he's just mocking them. The same way we've seen these people mock Jesus, the same way we saw Elijah mock the, the priests of Baal, he's doing the same thing. He's taking their own words and throwing it against them like they're nothing. That's mocking taking that person's words and throwing it back at him like he's nothing. Those words mean nothing. Show me. Go ahead. Turn to Mark. Mark chapter 10. Mark 10:32. 10, And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid, and he took again the twelve, and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him. Here it talks about they, all these people, that, and did we read in Matthew, they did it. They all mocked him. But it says here, The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. Three sets of people up here. And it says, And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and they and shall kill him, and the third day shall rise he shall rise again. On the third day he shall rise again. Okay. There it is, prophesying for it again. Turn to Mark 15. I'm going to really get this to sink in. True mocking is taking someone's words and showing such disdain and hate and disrespect towards them and throwing it back in their face. That's true mocking. These priests of Baal, or oh, our God's great and everything, look at us, our God's great. He took their words and threw it right back in their face. There's only one true God, Jesus Christ. Mark 15. Mark 15, 20. Or Mark 15, 16. We're going to start in Mark 15, 16. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they call... And they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it above, about his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. We read Matthew that what they're doing here is they're mocking him. And they smote him on the head with the reed and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, past tense, that's what everything that we read there is what's going on, they're mocking him. They took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Okay? They took his words and threw it in his face. Well, you're supposed to be a king, are you? And they threw it in his face. Total hate, total disdain, total disrespect. That's what real mocking is. Seeing this world mock the way it mocks God... Today, I don't want anything to do with mocking. All right. I just don't. God, let God do the mocking. He doesn't need our help. Let God do the mocking. You want to upset people? You want to ang anger people? Preach truth. Stand for absolute truth. 
It's going to anger people. It's going to upset people. A few days ago, I had someone go ahead and turn to Mark, or just over 28. Mark 15, 28. Just go down to Mark 15, 28. I had someone once again make a comment under one of my videos saying, another dung, Dunglinger clone. They're making fun of Brother Brian Denlinger's name, and they're mocking me. I'm preaching truth, and they can't handle it. But are they mocking me? No. They're mocking God. They can't deal with the, His Word that I'm preaching, and they're actually mocking God. God will deal with them. Every last one of them, God will deal with them. I mean, think about it. They continue to reject Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ. They refuse to have godly sorrow towards God for their personal sins. They love their worldly sorrow. They love their sins. They don't want to let it go. They're going to spend an eternity in, in the lake of fire. God will take care of it. Trust me, brothers and sisters of Christ. God will take care of it. Okay? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God will take care of it. Verse 28. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Remember the, the, the thieves on the cross. 28. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in the three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said, Amongst themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe that they that were crucified with him reviled him, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. Brother and sister in Christ, mocking is not something I believe we should be doing. God will do it. We can preach the Word of God, and sometimes they might believe that we're mocking them by preaching the Word of God. So be it. But stand for the Word of God. Let your yea be yea, your nay be nay. Stand for the Word of God and preach the Word of God. Don't fall into the trap of mocking. That's something that the lost world does to God. They mock God. And when you start falling into the trap of mocking, you answer, it says, answer not a fool according to his folly. Why? Lest thou also be like unto him. They look at you and say, you're no different than they are. You're no different than they are. They mock. Just something to think about, brothers and sisters of Christ. Be careful. You know, the Bible says, preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, reprove, correct with all, all long suffering and doctrine. Nowhere in there does it say, um, mock, mock. It doesn't say that in there at all. This is what we're supposed to our words. What are we supposed to hide in our heart? Mocking? No. What are we supposed to hide in our heart? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is what needs to be on our lips. This is what needs to be in our heart. This is what needs to be our life, how we're living our lives. Starting to get down reading this because what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if the people today, these professing Christians, they crucified Jesus Christ again. I'm sorry, they just, the Jesus that we preach, they have such hate and such disdain for him, just like these people do. They'd see him killed, they wouldn't care. And they keep saying, if he comes down from the cross, we believe. These people wouldn't believe. Look at the hate. The disrespect, the disdain they had for God manifest in the flesh. They wouldn't have believed. Turn to Luke 14. Luke 14. Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Keep going, 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not, 
sit not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Here we see the word mock. You know these professing Christians out there, they are given ammunition to the lost world to mock truly saved Christians. And brothers and sisters in Christ, when you say, I'm saved, God's changing my life, and you try to hold on to one area of your life, you fall under this. The foundation isn't complete. You haven't given everything to Jesus Christ. You're all on the altar before a sacrifice has not been laid. You give ammunition to the lost world to mock God. When you set a bad example for who a Christian, a Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman is supposed to be, you give ammunition to the lost world to mock. I wanted to read that one. Okay. One of the biggest things that's mocked today is having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is. It's mocked big time. And when that relationship is not strong, brothers and sisters of Christ, in your life, if that relationship is not strong and you're letting the cares of this world come in, you start giving in to temptation and start choosing to sin and start inviting sin back into your life, into your home, you know, your home that's supposed to be a stain from all appearance of evil, free zone, okay? When you start inviting those things back in, you give ammunition to the world to mock God and His Word. You're supposed to be a Christian, look at you. And brother, brothers, I'm saying this to myself as well. Make sure that your life is 100% about Jesus Christ. Do not give ammunition to the lost world. The Bible, when we talk about it, it's called losing your testimony. You can lose your testimony with people. I've lost my testimony with people. It's not fun. I've made mistakes and lost my testimony with neighbors, with family members. It's not fun. Okay, it gives them ammunition to mock the Word of God. I don't need to get to saved. Look, you're doing this, you're a hypocrite. Look, you're doing that, you're no di you look like me, talk like me, you're no different than me. You give ammunition to them to mock our Lord Jesus Christ. They're still going to have to answer for it, but you and I are still going to have to answer for our part at the judgment seat of Christ. And it's a scary thing to be at the judgment seat of Christ. I just wanted to read that because A, mocking's there. But brothers and sisters Christ, our foundation is this. And when you stray from it, your foundation is incomplete. Our foundation is Jesus Christ on the bottom and the top. He's the cornerstone. He's the foundation. And when you start straying from Him, and start going off on your own and going in the wrong direction, your foundation is incomplete. And you give ammunition to the lost world to mock. That's something the lost world does. They love to mock God. They like to mock God through you, brothers and sisters of Christ. They'll mock you and mock you and mock you, and you'll tell them, why are you mocking God in His perfect written word? I'm not mocking God. I'm mocking you. You're mocking God. Okay. Uh, uh, Elijah, when he mocked the priests of Baal, he didn't mock the priests themselves. Who would he mock? Their false god. The Bible says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rule, rulers of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I might be butchering that a little bit. But that's who we're supposed to be attacking, Satan. By standing for this word, you're attacking Satan. By having that changed life and doing everything you can to please God, you're attacking Satan. By being separate from this world, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Having a perfect heart with the Lord. You're separated from the world. Satan hates that. The lost world hates that. And they're going to mock you for it. Turn to Luke 18. 
Sorry this study went a little bit longer. Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. It's written in the Old Testament. Verse 32. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Verse 34. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Right. Here he is prophesying again, it's going to happen. I'm going to be mocked. Uh, turn to 22, Luke 22, verse 62. And Peter went out and whipped, wept bitterly. This is after Peter denies Jesus Christ three times. I did that study, Brother Sister Christ. I pray that some of you have watched it about Peter denying the Word. What leads you to denying the real Jesus Christ? Okay. He didn't understand. Remember what we read back there? They understood not. And when Jesus, when I did that study, I showed you how. Peter first he says that thou when Jesus says who do, who do you guys say that I am Peter speaks up and says thou art the Christ the Son of the Living God he's God manifest in the flesh he's our King he's the Christ then when he tells them this is going to happen to me they turn around and, and Peter's like be it far from me this isn't going to happen Lord he just turns he turns around and ends up denying the Word of God the old, the prophets the prophecies prove this is going to prove for once and for all, who Jesus is. Okay. Verse 63, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? They're mocking him. Oh, you are God, the Son of God. He made himself equal to God. I and my Father are one. They were stoning him not for the words he was saying, but that he made himself equal with God. In other words, he's claiming to be God. So they're mocking him. Verse 65, And many other things blasphemous spake they against him. They mocked him. They took his words and threw it in his face. They took the love that he had and threw it in his face. The counsel that he had and threw it in his face. The warnings that he had and threw it in his face. They were mocking him, taking his own words and belittling him with it. Twenty-three... Verse 6. Turn to Luke 23, verse 6. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was a, at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him, of the long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. He was wanting to sit back and, and enjoy the show. Verse 9, Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, when his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. Sorry. <clears throat> there we see the mocking again. They mocked him. Right. He wanted to see a show, and Jesus wouldn't put on a show for him. Okay. Today, that's another a whole other teaching. But today, people want Jesus to dance to their strings. Like they want, like they're the puppet masters, and Jesus is supposed to just dance to their, to their what they want, and give them what they want, and do what they want. 
and be the Jesus that they want. It doesn't work that way. It never worked that way throughout all eternity. It's never been that way, and it never will be that way. My God, Lord and Savior, doesn't dance to anybody else's strings. But he was mocked when he didn't please them. He was mocked and then sent back. Now, I'm supposed to keep going. Uh, verse 12. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were en at enmity between themselves. That verse is a big teaching that we teach where it's like, we've seen it, brother, sister Christ, you've seen it. We've seen people that attack each other, they hate each other, and they're attacking each other. But the one thing that they'll unite on is when it comes to attacking true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. The one thing that they united on was that they were mocking Jesus. Their men mocked him, and they became good friends against Jesus Christ. You say, well, but Pilate, he kept saying that I find no fault in him. Pilate still ordered him to be crucified, an innocent man. He gave in to the words of the people. He didn't know it was right. He did what the world wanted. Did things the world's way. Luke 32.44. Turn to Luke 32.44. Actually. Yeah. Did I do this wrong? I think I read it. I wrote it down wrong. It's 23, I'm sorry. We're still in 23. I, I just, when you type sometimes, you can type fast, and you put one letter before the other. Um, but it's 23, Luke 23, 36. Or number before the other. <clears throat> Luke 23, 36. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, and offered him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. There we see mocking again. And a superscription also was written over him in a letter of Greek, and Latin, and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were ra hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. He didn't care that he was the Christ. He just wanted to get, he saved me. I, I'm not sorry for what I'm doing, just save us. And he did it in a, such, he was mocking him. Verse 40, because we read in the other ones, he was mocking. In the other, in the other uh, Gospels, both were mocking him. But look at the change there is here. Verse 40, but the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not, dost not thou fear God? None of these people are showing any fear of God whatsoever. The way they're treating our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. He's saying we're sinners. We are condemned justly. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. That thief mocked God. He was one of those people that were mocking God, throwing everything in his face. You can still get saved today. I know this is Old Testament, but this is evidence of repentance having sorrow in his heart for who he was to the point where he was defending Jesus Christ. Okay, this is repentance. Sorrow towards God. Sorrow towards Jesus Christ that he was defending him. Okay, those of you that have, if, if there's lost people out there watching this and you've mocked this ministry, you've mocked the Word of God through this ministry, you can still get saved. And I've seen people do it. People got mad at me and mocked me when I started standing against the Trinity because it's Godhead. The Bible says Godhead. I'm going to say Godhead. Get rid of the word Trinity. It's not in Scripture. Are you a Bible believer? Yeah, I'm a Bible believer. Then why do you say Trinity? There's nothing wrong with saying Trinity. You're not a Bible believer. 
You're a Bible corrector. You're a Bible adder. You're a Bible doubter. And I showed that video where a pastor came out and actually said that the Godhead had nothing to do with the Trinity. It just means that Jesus had the qualities of God. And then he goes over here and starts preaching the Trinity over here. They separated the two to get you completely away from Godhead. And I've had people that were hardcore Trinitarians that have come back and said, you know what, you're right, I need to stand for the Word of God. And they repented. I need to stand for the Word of God. I was being stubborn. I thought I was defending my Lord and Savior, but in, in truth, I was mocking my Lord and Savior. Jesus is the only person singular of the Godhead. The only person in the Bible, uh, the part of the Godhead that's labeled a person is Jesus Christ. For in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit. Jesus is the body. Jesus has the Holy Ghost in Him, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father in Him. These three are one. Okay, Jesus is the only person because He has a body, soul, and spirit. And I've, it seems like I've said it a million times. The true biblical definition of a person is somebody that has a body and a soul, and it's always referred to someone who is living. You might be referring to someone who's dead, but when you say person, you're referring to the past when he was living. Do you remember that person that used to do such and such? Oh yeah, he's dead now. But the person, when you use the word person, is referring to when he was alive. Okay? I keep, it's like a broken record for some of these people. Well, I don't care. I'm going to keep calling the Holy Spirit a person. He doesn't have a body, soul, and spirit of his own. I don't care. I'm going to call God the Father a person. He doesn't have a body, soul, and spirit of his own. Jesus is the only person of the Godhead. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Mm -hmm. But I've seen people repent. I've seen people come back from mocking God. Just because you've mocked God doesn't mean you're destined for hell and there's nothing you can do. There's still time, if you're listening to this, there's still time to fall flat on your face before the Lord in true biblical repentance. True biblical repentance. Having godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. Everything we just read that Jesus went through was because of your sins. Come to Him broken, having sorrow. Let go of this world. It is not worth it. Let go of the worldly sorrow. It is not worth it. Give your life to Christ. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Everything He went through, that the blood that was shed is God's blood. It was shed for you. It was shed because of you. He died and He rose again the third day, proving that He is God. Confess both that in prayer. Fall on your knees in prayer before God and start your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Confess that you're a that you're, you're sinner, that you've sinned against God, and have sorrow in your heart when you're confessing for those personal sins that you've sinned against Him. Not that we're all sinners, your personal sins. Confess that your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that you're not ashamed anymore. And ask God to save you. He can save you. This thief on the cross railed on him. Jesus hadn't rose from the dead yet. Jesus is God. So at that time, when Jesus forgave someone, it was forgiven. Okay? Jesus forgave that man, and that man railed on him. He mocked him along with everybody else. You can still get saved today. It's not too late. Mm -hmm. It is not too late. Now, I'll say this again for the brethren out there. Show me scripture below, and we'll talk about it in the, in the comment section. A, part where you, a place where you think Jesus is actually mocking someone. Let's see if he's taking their words and throwing it back in their face and making it out and just you know disrespecting them throwing it back in their face having no you know the way we've seen here the way people mock throwing it in their face taking their words throwing it in their face and treating their words like they're nothing 
Show me in Scripture. Okay. Jesus called names. He used names to describe who they were and how they were acting. He used parables to describe who they were. But he did it all to teach the twelve, the twelve apostles, his disciples, people who wanted to know the truth. For you it is given to know the truth. Why? Because they wanted to know the truth. They were seeking the truth. They were following the truth wherever he went. They were following him. Okay? He's preached the truth to them. Now, turn to Acts chapter 17. Doesn't tell me how long it's been. It's been a while, hasn't it? Acts, you really get into the Word of God. You really get into teaching. And sometimes studies are just going to be long. Remember the part about Paul preaching all night? Someone fell off the rafters. I believe he died. And Paul just, through the Holy Spirit, raised him up. Here, he eats some food. And they went back, back to preaching. They didn't say, oh, we should call it a night. He went right back to preaching. Acts 17. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hills and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now is Paul mocking them? No. Is this a good opportunity to mock? They're, they have an unknown God and everything. They're ignorant. No, he doesn't mock them. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 24. God hath made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelling not in temples made with hands. Battle buildings, see him. 25. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and, made, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, and if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He's there knocking. He's knocking on the door. 28. For in him we live and move and have our being as certain as of also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are his offspring, we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. It's one of those things where I always preached against um, people who draw, like you have Peter Ruckman, drawing Jesus Christ. That's a sin. Okay? Uh, chick publications, trying to draw the Godhead, trying to draw Jesus Christ. It's a sin. Jesus is the image of the Godhead. We're not to liken God to, uh, to gold. The Godhead is likened unto gold. Jesus is the Godhead. He's the image of the Godhead. If you were going to draw the Godhead, it would be Jesus Christ. It wouldn't be all these satanic symbols that they use. Okay. It would be Jesus Christ. But we're not to have images of the Godhead. We're not supposed to have images of Jesus Christ because people are going to come out there and they're going to try to fool you into believing in a false Jesus. And this image that people get of Jesus Christ, that's not Jesus Christ. That's the Antichrist. When the Antichrist comes, it's a whole other study. I'm kind of going off a little bit. That's who's coming. That's who they're going to believe in because they're saying, hey, there's the picture of Jesus that they've always showed down through the centuries. That's got to be him. No, it's the Antichrist. Verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. What are those people's attitude? Peter Ruckman has passed away, but if he was alive and I was to tell him this, what would his reaction be? I know what David Daniel's reaction was when we told him, at this time, at this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. He refuses to repent. David Daniel has no problem drawing images of Jesus Christ, drawing images of the Godhead. No conviction. 
He needs to repent. Verse 31, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. They, he preached the resurrection. And they believed. Among which, among the which was Dionysus, the Ara... The guy, I can't pronounce that. Ario Pegite something. And a woman named Demarius and others with them. I need to listen to Alexander score me a little bit more in the New Testament. Uh, but people believed and got saved. Some mocked, some said, Will you hear thee of this matter again some other time? And some got saved. And those are the three re reactions you're going to get from the world. When we preach absolute truth, you're going to get people that mock us. You're going to get people that don't really want to believe yet, but they'll hear of the matter again. We'll hear of thee of this matter again. And you're going to have people that get saved. Why are we doing it for those people that get saved, the third part? That's why we do this, brothers and sisters of Christ, because we want those people to get saved. We want to see people get saved, to have a new life, to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I want to see people go to heaven. But you get these people that when we preach truth, they mock us. Here's an example of them mocking Paul. Here's also an example where if you were lost, you look at this and go, Paul, that was a great a time, a example, a great opportunity for you to mock them. I mean, they've got a thing, a sign of somebody that says to the unknown God, you're worshiping something you have no clue about. That was a great opportunity to mock them, Paul. But he didn't. He just preached truth. And what happened when he just preached truth? They ended up mocking him. Yeah. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 10. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nature and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers. We have a lot of those in this world. We read it there. Um... Pilate was a man pleaser. Saul, King Saul, we did our study, he was a man pleaser. Okay? He wasn't a God pleaser, he was a man pleaser. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The will of God from the heart. Yeah. Verse 7. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. Am I doing this right? I'm sorry. The study's getting so long, I lost track of where I was. Please forgive me. I am in Ephesians 6, but that's still a good point. Your word is in the heart. <laughs> okay? Where it talks about that, good from the heart. And probably God wants us to read that, because here's the thing. People take advantage of God's grace. When we get over to, let's do Galatians this time. I had everything. Second, first, second Corinthians, Galatians. That's how the life of a Christian is supposed to be. It's about the heart. We live a life of Christ because we love the Lord and we want to please Him. We no longer sin because we, uh, as far as we purposely sin, 
We choose to sin because we fall into temptation and we choose to sin. But what I'm saying is, is we're no longer the servants of sin. We want to please God and we want to get sin out of our life. But I'm sorry, I read the wrong thing. I was in Ephesians. Galatians 6.1 There we go. Brethren, if, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, and considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What do we read up there? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be tempted. You don't be like them, you don't act like the lost world, and everything it says, do it with meekness. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Be there for one another. We have a lot of brethren hurting right now, financially, and uh, a lot of brethren hurting big time when it comes to fellowship, lack of fellowship. Um, be there to fellowship for the brethren. Be there to help the brethren, those that have been blessed by the Lord financially, to help those that haven't. Right. Verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. That's so true. So many of these people puffed up that they're mocking God. They think they're something. Uh, Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, they think they're something. The soldiers, they thought they were something. The people, the Jewish people stand there mocking them. Along with everybody else. They must have thought they were something. They're nothing. Verse 4. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. This is how we know how to live right and do good works. Our good works need to be based off scripture, not the ways of the world. Here we get into it, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For if that's for he that soweth to his flesh shall also reap corruption. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How do we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God is not mocked. You have all these professing fake fraud Christians that say, I can have my sin, I can have this world, I can live the life I want to live and please my flesh and call myself a Christian. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. They're mocking God with the life that they're living. Oh, look at me, I'm a Christian, and I look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's joke, I attack God's perfect written word, I profess to be a Bible believer. You have those people, I profess to be a Bible believer, but I still attack God's word. I attack absolute truth, I attack the changed life, I attack true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. What's going on here? They're mocking God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. He that soweth to his flesh shall also of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, capital S Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9, And let us not be wary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I just want to encourage you, uh, you don't need my pat on the back, but those of you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that are still staying the course, you're still cleaning up your life, there's still sanctification going on, but you have the love of the Lord that you don't want sin in your life. Someone comes along and shows you in Scripture what you're doing is a sin. You get it out. You have that heartfelt attitude of getting it out of your life. Praise the Lord. Okay? Don't faint. If we faint not, in due season we shall reap. I keep saying this. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Okay? There's so many people out there that says, that are part of this easy believism, <clears throat> part of this easy believism, And they say, I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. But they don't have their eyes on Jesus Christ. They're liars. And words, they profess to know me. But in works, they deny me. In words, they profess to believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble 
catching away the body of Christ. But in works, they deny it. Their eyes aren't on Jesus. Their eyes are on the world. They're living it up. Okay? Those of you who have really, God has really changed your life. I've been reading some testimonies lately. Praise the Lord that you're changing and trying to do your best now to please the Lord. Hold the course. Stay that course. Don't go to the right. Don't go to the left. Don't get deceived into stopping. And definitely don't get deceived into falling back <clears throat> and resurrecting the old man, trying to backpedal. Okay? Stay the course, if we faint not. But to those out there, those false converts out there, brothers and sisters in Christ, God is, be not deceived, God is not mocked. They think they're, they're, just, they're mocking God with the life they're living, but God isn't mocked. They're, they're reaping destruction. They're reaping corruption. The same goes for those of you who are saved. You think you can have sin for a season? I mean, those that I believe are saved, you think you can have sin for a season? No. God is not mocked. You start mocking God when you think you can have sin for a season. And what are you doing? You're reaping corruption. A lot of that stuff is just going to get burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. I am so fearful of the Lord that when I go there and stand before the Lord, the judgment seat of Christ, that my word, that I can get something, Lord, please, something, because I have done so much that's going to just get burnt up. I've done so much that I'm, my face is going to be face down on his feet with tears saying, Lord, I'm sorry for all the stupid stuff I did as a saved Christian, the mistakes that I made, okay. the sin for a season. Get that stuff out of your life. It's not worth it. Focus. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. That's what communion is about, reflecting on your life. I'm going through Ephesians right now and, and applying it to my life. I'm doing an expository study, uh, King James Video Ministries, and going through my life and applying it to my life. Is there still stuff I need to clean up out of my life? Is there still things I need to be doing for the Lord? Okay, Keep your eyes on Jesus. He could come back right now as I'm doing this video. That needs to be your attitude. He could come back right now. Am I doing right? Where's the fear of the Lord? You start falling into sin or falling into temptation. Sorry, brother. Uh, he knows who he is that corrected me. Um, falling into sin, or I said it again, falling into temptation and choosing to sin, you start sinning. Where's that attitude of Jesus could come back today? He could come back right now while I'm doing this. Oh, Lord, please forgive me and repent and get that out of your life. Pick up your cross and get back to where, you, where we're following the Lord. Okay? Don't mock God with your life. That's what we're seeing here. You can mock God with your life. But be not deceived. You're really not mocking God. You're really just destroying your own life. You're reaping corruption. Last verse, Jude 1. Turn to ver Jude chapter 1. Might be only one chapter in Jude. Yep, only one chapter in Jude. Jude. Chapter 1, not chapter 2, but chapter 1. Uh, 14, we're going to read 14 through 21. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Speech. Verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaking great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Being respecter of persons. And they get something out of it. Verse 17, But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. This is why I said we'd tie it back into the number one reason why people will mock. They think they're mocking you, brothers and sisters in Christ, for living a godly life, for truly being a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, with a changed life, 
preaching truth, the number one reason they mock you is this right here. How that they are told that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Their sin. They love sin. They love their flesh. They love this world. That's why they mock you. Verse 19. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. I was only supposed to read to 21. Okay. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. These people, they'll mock you because they love their flesh. We saw Paul. He preached truth. We preach truth because we love the Lord. We stand for truth and live truth because we love the Lord. The lost world loves the... Lo, we love the Lord. My throat's getting... <laughs> we love the Lord. The lost world loves the world. They love their flesh. So what are they going to do? They're going to mock. They're going to mock us who love the Lord. The sign of someone who loves the Lord, you know what the sign is? Remember what the Bible said. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Mocking the lost world isn't a sign of love for Jesus Christ. The sign of love for Jesus Christ is keeping his perfect written word. And how do you keep his perfect written word? You hide it in your heart. I'm sorry the study went as long as it did, brothers and sisters in Christ. But remember, Proverbs 26.4, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be likened to him. We're supposed to be separate from the world. We're not supposed to be acting like the world, laughing at the world. Or no, we're not supposed to be looking like the world, acting like the world, laughing at the world's jokes. Looking, speaking, acting. Why? Because we're not supposed to lose our testimony. Lest thou be likened to him. Well, I'm going to mock this guy by doing the same thing he's doing. No, you don't. Well, I'm going to mock this person by looking like he's looking. No, you don't. Lest thou also be like unto him. The world looks at you and says, you're like him. That's the danger here. When you answer a fool according to his folly, it's a warning that you don't look like him and act like him. And the world doesn't look at you and lump you up with them. The lost world loves to mock. They love to mock God. They like to mock God through you. Are we supposed to be doing that and mocking the lost world? So when someone comes by and says, I'm talking about we mock a lot of these professing Christians. I've seen people mock them. Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. When someone who comes who doesn't know Jesus and they see these two people preaching this Jesus and this person preaching this Jesus and you guys are just backbiting and just going at it, mocking each other, you, just, you both look alike. You look the same. What's the difference? The difference is, is we just preach the truth. Let them mock. Let them do the mocking. God will take care of mocking them. Okay? God is not mocked. They're so, so uh, crush, they're reaping corruption. We just stand for the truth, brothers and sisters in Christ. Just stand for the truth. Live the truth. Hide it in your heart. Let the lost world mock you. Understand that they're not mocking you. Don't take it personally. They're mocking God. Mm -hmm. So answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be likened to him. When it comes to mocking. I really want to talk about this because I see mocking. When it comes to name calling, be careful with the name calling. When Jesus called and used names like viper, serpent, there was a meaning behind it. He didn't call names just to call names. And he never attacked anybody's name personally. I've always pushed this, brothers. I just want to throw this out there real quick. I've always pushed this. At the great white throne, your name, not us, but the lost world, their name's going to be called, and they're going to be stepping forward to their name. God's not going to mock their name. He's going to say, Stephen Anderson, come forward. And he's going to have to step forward and answer for everything. His works, he's going to see if his works got him out of hell. And he's going to find out it didn't. Okay. He's going to call people by their names. Saying, if I say Steve Anderson's a snake, 
Yeah, that's okay, because it's true. He's double-tongued, and he's trying to slither his way into where he doesn't belong. He's trying to act like he's a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, part of the Bible-believing movement, and he has nothing to do with us. He's false. He's fake. Robert Breaker, same way. Edward P.F., same way. But you don't make fun of these guys' names, and you don't mock them. We just preach truth. You want to upset them? Preach the truth. Look how upset Edward P.F. is at me. Made videos. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a nobody, and he made videos about me. Uh, I don't have the following that King James Video Ministry has. I don't have the following because he even attacks Robert Breaker. They all united to attack King James Video Ministries, brothers and sisters in Christ. But they're still attacking each other, too. But these people don't fall into the trap of mocking them. Okay, Don't fall into the trap of becoming like them. Okay? Just preach the truth. That upsets them enough. Okay? I get attacked by a lot of people because I just preach the truth. And I'm a nobody. Okay? If you think you are somebody, <laughs> be careful that you are nobody. Okay? I should be a nobody to them. Yet they're treating me like I'm somebody. Okay? That's weird, isn't it? It's, it's the opposite. Okay? To the Lord, I'm somebody. Absolutely. But I am down here, God is up here, His Word is up here, and I pray it's the same in your life. I need to stop so we can end this video. So brothers and sisters, my encouragement to you, stand for the Word of God, continue to live the Word of God. Those of you who are false converts or, or lost out there, please get saved. Please come to God broken so you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. For the brethren, be careful, don't fall into the trap of mocking. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Okay? So we'll end that here with grace and peace from God our Father and my love for the brethren out there, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And my love for the lost world is preaching Jesus to you, preaching repentance. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So thank you for watching.